First up is uh, Bobby Mead from uh, GPI in Kentucky. He will talk slower than I do because, you know, he's, he's a southern gentleman. You know, I'm from New Jersey. Um, he retired from the Kentucky Transportation Cabinet in 2007. Uh, probably many of you in this room know him. Uh, if you don't, he's a wealth of information. And, uh, you know, at the Cabinet, he was responsible for the bridge painting program. He now works part time for GPI, as well as I know he, you know, he didn't leave his roots in Ken at the Kentucky Transportation Cabinet. He uh, provides services for them as well. He works part time for the university and in their bridge preservation. Co so let's give uh, Bob and me a warm welcome. Well, I'm not sure about that uh, speed of speech because I. Uh, I thought Ed gave me an hour, and I, but, but not, not just kidding about the hour, but still, uh, I'm probably going to rush through this a little bit just uh, uh, to get through it all. But yeah, greetings from the Commonwealth of Kentucky. I know I'm a, uh, I'm, I'm a transplant up here for the next few days, but uh, I think we have a lot of common problems and common issues and questions. Um, okay, so. Beam ends, and we've all talked about, I mean, I've heard a lot of discussion yesterday about uh, problems with steel and concrete bridges at the beam ends. We're focusing here on steel uh, protective coatings or treatments of steel beams. Some of the problems that we run into with steel beams and the ends of them is that we often get a lot of, uh, of debris. Uh, the debris will both hold both water and contaminants and chlorides, attracts moisture. We uh, and I'm sure everybody can, can uh, agree with this, L joints tend to leak. Uh, and when they leak, at least in Kentucky and, and all across the snow and ice part of the United States, we get a lot of uh, salts and chlorides primarily, but other things that, uh, that leak through those joints and sit on the ends of our beams. So we get extended through the leaking uh, extended time of wetness and the contaminants. And the result of that is that we get localized Premature co uh, coatings failures. You know, we were talking yesterday at one of our, our breakout sessions that uh, if you know if we go out and do a maintenance painting project on a bridge, the uh, the overall protective coating system we look at them as maybe lasting 20 years, but probably 95 or 98 percent of that protective coating system will last much longer than that. But you get failures in certain localized areas that are predictable. And beam ends are, are probably the worst case for that. Uh, just, just a few slides here of some of the examples of what happens at beam ends. And uh, as you can see here, sometimes it gets rather uh, a rather large loss of section. Uh, I have seen uh, diaphragms uh, near abutments underneath leaky joints that are completely gone and, and holes in, in beams that you could stick your head through. I don't have the picture of the one you could put your head through. I, I've actually seen uh, beam ends in Kentucky that erosion uh, on the slopes and in debris from, from people throwing things there have actually covered the bottom flange. It's buried in the, in the dirt and the, and the debris. So it makes for a real mess. So what are the, some of the things that we, we historically do and maybe want to consider doing? Uh, first of all, we need to clean those areas, which means in a lot of cases removing the debris, but also washing the, uh, the beam ends along with, you know, splash zones and other parts of the bridge. Um, the surface preparation and coating application on these areas are problematic in that it's very rough uh, pitted steel and, and high chloride levels. And that means that you have problems getting a protective coating on there that will remain there and do a good job of protecting the steel. Uh, we have found that if we do uh, uh, blast, not so much power tool, but, but abrasive blast cleaning and put zinc primers on, you get a little more surface life out of that, but the zinc coatings don't last as long in those areas as they do on areas that, that don't have that kind of time of wetness and, and chloride contamination. And then, of course, uh, when we're working with these beam ends, we're liable to run into. We've replaced uh, the coatings on a lot of our lead-coated bridges, but there's still hundreds of them in Kentucky. And uh, that's apt to be a problem at any time. So we were looking for some other options. And the, the uh, Kentucky Transportation Cabinet had asked us at the University of Kentucky to seek some 
alternative uh, means to address these beam-in issues for steel beams. And generally, this is what they wanted, was they wanted an effect, a, a treatment for these beam-ins that would be effective for five years. Uh, they, they wanted something that was easy and simple to apply. Uh, they didn't want to have to do any kind of uh, really intensive surface preparation, and they didn't want uh, coatings that were uh, difficult to use, multi-components and things like that. Now, our maintenance crews are great, but they don't specialize in, in steel coatings and surface preparation and steel coatings. They want, so we, they wanted things that, that they could do with the maintenance crews in Kentucky with limited worker safety environmental issues, no specialized skills, and just using basic tools. So the way we approached this was to look for something other. We've, you know, I've, I've worked with thin film coatings for steel and concrete for decades, but they wanted to look at some possible other answers. And so we decided to look at some super barriers and we, we, look, we solicited a bunch of different uh, industries different users and we had two or three dozen products uh, uh, supplied but we chose out of that for you know time and space limitations as much as anything else and sometimes with the practicality of using the product four tapes three uh, adhesive sheets tapes and sheets are, are both just materials with, with adhesives on the back and I, we just separated those to tapes and sheets due to the dimensions of them uh, two greases and then a couple of non-traditional liquid applied thin film coatings. Where Interstate 64 and 75 run concurrent around Lexington, Kentucky and cross over US 68 is the field location of where we applied these coatings. It's a multi-span, multi-girder bridge and at the end of the third span is a transverse uh, uh, joint, a large, uh, you know, expansion joint that I know for the last 12 years uh, has been replaced three times and every time it's replaced it doesn't work a full year it starts leaking again you can see here the signs of the water uh, that it, that has come down on the uh, the concrete pier cap the steel underneath was not horrible uh, as you can see here but uh, there was a bit of rust you can see in the right hand picture the light coming from the joint above where there's no seal in it you can see the debris on the pier cap you can see the debris on the uh, bottom flange of the steel on the right picture we went through we didn't pull necessarily every area that we looked at but we did a number of adhesive pulls and we were around the 12 uh, I mean it, it ranged from 900,000 to 12 1300 but this was typical and then we also did uh, some chloride extraction film test and we ranged from 15 to 20 micrograms per square centimeter where there was intact coatings the guys were having problems on the really rusted pitted stuff so I don't know what the chlorides were on those really rusted areas I'm sure it was higher to reflect Kentucky's maintenance painting special notes in Kentucky we typically specify for maintenance painting projects that any stratified rust not packed rust but stratified uh, would be removed by impact because we've seen that tools needle guns wire brushes even abrasive blast in some cases will polish hard rust uh, the best way to remove it is to impact so started out where we had some stratified rust removing it with a hammer uh, the cleaning process then included scraping just a hand scraper there were no power tools used here to remove what material we could and then wire brushing it to get the loose edges and then wiping down with burlap I was surprised at how much burlap cleans but burlap cleans up still very well and then finally for each site uh, we had a white rag wipe test and retained that uh, just to be able to go back and review how clean or how dirty that seal was after the cleaning process and then we applied those 11 products that we were talking about this is the application of the grease as I said we, we did not want to use anything that had complicated application instructions and and as for some of these greases they recommended heating them uh, we didn't we were going to use everything straight out of the box and it's stiff enough that you have to use a scraper to put it on 
This is actually uh, one of the thin film coatings. Uh, this is actually a castor oil gypsum mix. It's very difficult to apply. This is the other, another thin film coating. You'll see more of them in just a minute with some more labeling on it. This is a, uh, a, a Tedlar tape. And then this is one of the things that we called a sheet. It's got an adhesive on the back and, and it's wide enough that two pieces would cover the uh, uh, entire one side of the beam, including the top and bottom flange. And on, on some of these, and this is one where we used a caulk to seal the edges. This is another one, a polyurethane sheet, and we use caulk to seal the edges. This is actually a, uh, a waxy, greasy product that's embedded in this tape. And you can see, if I can get my mouse to work. Okay, uh, here there's like little styrofoam pellets with uh, that's embedded in this product, this greasy, waxy product, and it's used to mold around sharp corners or in uh, uh, or around the bolt patterns. A very a similar one here with the same sort of material that uh, you use to mold in sharp corners and around bolt patterns. This was put on in 2013. In 2015, we went back and reviewed all of them for performance. And this is the, uh, it's an aerospace sealant thin film coatings on the left, it's a paint. On the right is one of the greases. And this is 2016. I'm just including these to show you that after three plus years service, uh, they're, they're hanging in there and protecting the steel. Some of them are ugly, but, and you can see all the debris uh, that has washed through that open joint and come down on the steel and on the pier cap. Actually, when we went back in 2016, we removed some of these coatings, scraped these off, and on the films, we, we cut those and looked behind them. Uh, just due to time limitations, I didn't include those pictures, but we found uh, other than one of the coatings, there was no corrosion, uh, no increases that we saw. More of the grease. Uh, this is the one in 2015. This is the gypsum castor oil thin film coating. Uh, as you can see, it's, it has uh, very poor wetting properties and, and very poor sag resistance. And in order to get it on and get coverage, uh, it's, it's thick enough, then it falls off the steel. And as you can see down in the, uh, the end of the beam at the bottom side, you can see the uh, breakthrough some, for some corrosion there. And you can see that it's increased a little bit in 2016. Uh, this is a clear polyester sheet. Again, it, one of them that had the caulking at the uh, edges of it. And as you can see, it's clear and there's no corrosion behind it, but there wasn't a lot in this particular location. You can see some at the top of the, of the web there. And this is uh, an aluminum foil with adhesive back sheet, again, wide enough that two pieces. And that's one of the things, we eliminated some of the material simply because it was too cumbersome. If it has a, a contact type of adhesive or it's too big and you're working on a pier cap, you don't have a lot of room and you end up with stuff that uh, you just can't get up there without it sticking to itself or everything around you and, and, and you end up in a ball of, of coating up of some kind up there and all taped up. Uh, this is the, the same product, the other end of that uh, diaphragm. Uh, there was some rust underneath it here, but nothing is shown after, you know, the three years of service. This is the poly polyvinyl fluoride tape. Uh, we removed some of it, no rust behind it. This is 2016. The, the black polyurethane sheeting, 2015, 2016. These products, uh, the, this is the petroleum salacious uh, uh, impregnated tape, and uh, they seem to do a very good job. There's some uh, staining on that, but it's coming from above. Uh, if you look behind the tape, there's no corrosion there. It's coming from the interface between the concrete deck and the top of the beam. This is a 2016 image of it, and this is the other product that uh, had the uh, polymer compound in, in impregnated tape. And this one is something that uh, one of the guys went out to the local uh, 
Home Depot, or I think it was a Home Depot, and, and not a Lowe's, and he bought some, uh, it's actually a roofing repair com, uh, tape, and, uh, and applied it. It wasn't applied the same as the others. As you can see, we didn't wrap the top part of the beam or the top flange, but this material uh, seems to be working. No, there's no, no rust behind it. So I know it's a little early. It's three years. We, we want something to get five years, but it looks like we'll get there. Uh, I know that we probably wouldn't be better off showing some of the images from behind these coatings because some of them you can't see through. But it appears that we don't have to rely on, on simply uh, traditionally applied thin film liquid coatings. Uh, these tapes and barriers appear to do a very good job. They're ugly in most cases. Those waxes are ugly and messy. But we had this discussion earlier. One of the concerns that even the cabinet had was, well, if you go out and put this product on, what are we going to do five or ten years from now when we want to do a maintenance painting project on that? Well, if that was over the entire bridge, we would have an issue. But for the, just these beam ends where you want to get some additional protection, uh, we did some scraping on that uh, with a dull scraper. We put it on with a scraper. You can scrape most of it off with a scraper and wipe it down with a solvent. And, uh, and if you had thousands of square feet, that would be an issue. But for tens of square feet, it's not that big a deal to clean them up. So there are some effective beam end treatments. They can be applied with low tech surface prep, hand tools, they can protect the steel in a challenging environment, and the issue is going to be their durability, but at this point, I'm, I'm convinced that we're going to meet the five years. Okay, I think that's it. If you have any questions. Does anybody have any questions? I guess two. Um, how would you, or none of those examples had holes actually in the beams? Right. So in a situation like that, would you guys recommend that that would be, be done? And also for the inspection, what would the crews now judge for rating that area? In other words, how would they actually give you a, a condition state that that would be in? That would be difficult, wouldn't it? <laughs> and, and, and we've thought about that in that, you know, you can't, you can't inspect for a crack on some of these, on most of these, but uh, these are very limited to, to just the beam ends in these limited areas. and. Uh, and the cabinet was seeking something to put on there that lasts because they've tried traditional coatings in the past and after a year or two, you know, they'll be rusting back through and coming out. Just barrier coatings. How would you limit the use of this? In other words, would you say or recommend that would this be put on beams with heavy deep pitting or with holes or not? Well, uh, it, it can be put on, uh, you know, corroded, heavily corroded uh, areas. But it also, you can put it on areas that, you know, adjacent to those. I mean, a lot of these really didn't have, a few of these had areas that had no corrosion. Uh, all of them had a certain amount of corrosion where we put the coatings. But the intent there was just to get, the, within that leaky joint, try to get enough distance out that you're going to keep water from coming through, the net, coming through that leaking joint and getting on the steel at that location. We put this stuff back uh, on the beam ends just like four feet or something. Three or four feet. Yeah, I think I think your questions are going to be you know answered by each uh, department of transportation, right? It'll be decided by them. Like you know what they're showing you is there there are products out there that you could put there. Again, it's it's not going to be a panacea. I don't think he's saying that, but I think each DOT would have to determine. Yes, we can. We want to do this here, and I think. You know, they're looking for five years. It sounds like that would be something that they'd say, okay, we're going to put this here, and within five years, we're going to come back and paint the bridge, right? So you're looking at this is a stopgap measure, something to tide you over, uh, you know, so. But uh, any other questions? Um, I, I had one for you. You said you could clean this up with solvents. Was, was there any concern about um, the material from an environmental perspective, you know, AKA the lead paint that we put on it. You know, I know this was all readily available, but when you take it off, was there any concern there? That was not a concern that was raised. Uh, initially, there was some discussion about that, and that's one of the reasons the cabinet did not want to use uh, power, you know, power tools or abrasive blasting. Uh, if you go out with a dull scraper and a wire brush, you need some, a respirator. Right. 
and if you're in some of these areas, there's enough bird droppings and stuff, you need a respirator for that reason. But uh, you don't mobilize enough uh, in that case to, uh, to really rise to a problem. It, we didn't feel that we did. And so uh, let's, give, let's give Bobby a hand. 